Hi, this is Rui Neves Silva. Welcome to Control Theory. Today's session is about turning the knobs. Turning the knobs here means to understand what happens when we change the order and the values of the parameters of the system's transfer function. The order of the transfer function is the degree of the denominator, which is the same as to say its number of poles. Let us start with the basic first order system. This is a possible representation of a first order system without zeros. We have two parameters A and K. A common representation with a little more information is this one defining tau, the time constant of the system. Take the example of a RC circuit. Can you get the transfer function and the corresponding time constant? I leave it as an exercise to you that the time constant is the product of R by C with the result in seconds. Let us check the time response analysis of the first order system. The time response analysis consists in exciting the system with a test signal and observe its response. A common test signal is the step signal, as it is easy to apply. And then we analyze the system's response, that's the step response. This slide depicts the step response of the first order system without zeros. Note that this transfer function has a pole in minus a equal to the inverse of the time constant. The time constant defines how fast the system reacts to a variation at the input. You can see at the plot that the tangent of the curve at the origin can be quickly estimated from the value of tau. Additionally, after 3 tau, you have reached 95% of the final value. If the excitation is made with a unit step, the final value is given by the gain k. We already know that the pole has to be on the left side of the S-plane for stability. The further the pole is to the left, away from the origin, the faster the system response will be. Changing the value of the gain k only changes the amplitude of the response. When the pole becomes near to the origin, the response is slower. When the pole becomes farther from the origin, the response is faster. There is a special case of the first order system corresponding to the effect of accumulation. In this case, the output of the plant is the integration of the input with gain k. So this transfer function is the integrator. The integrated is 1 over s. Then we can have an additional gain k. If we excite an integrated with a unitary step, it will integrate the area of the step indefinitely. Note that the integrator has its pole already on the imaginary axis, and therefore it is not asymptotically stable. Consider this exercise where the upper plot is the input signal, and now let us draw the output of an integrated with gain 1 and 0 on the initial condition. In the first period, we have the integration of the step. Then, with zero at the input, the integrator retains the value. Then, we integrate the negative area, so the integrator comes down. And when integrating a ramp, 
what we have at the output is a parabola. And finally, we will retain the value. Reflect a little bit about this exercise. It is very important to emphasize this aspect that the output of the integrator can retain a value different from zero even when it has zero at the input. Although the integrator is not a stable element, we can develop any LTI system from the combination of integrator blocks, including the stable ones. Take this stable transfer function for example. From the function, we can write this relationship. That can be drawn in a block diagram such as this. So, it is possible to build any linear system using only sum, gain and integrator blocks. Note that the sum and gain blocks are static. This means without dynamic. Let us now add some complexity with the second order system. This is a second order transfer function without zeros. We have here three parameters, A1, A2 and B0. The relation between the behavior of the system and each of these parameters is not direct. So it is more common to see the second order transfer function represented as this. We have again three parameters, k, d, and omega n. k is the static gain because it tells us what is the final value of the unitary step response. d is the damping factor without dimension that affects the shape of the response. And omega n is the natural frequency in radians per second affecting only the time scale of the response. From the quadratic formula, you have the location of the two poles given by this. And it is easy to verify that if d is equal to 1, the second term disappears and we have a double pole. This is two poles on exactly the same location on the real axis. And this is minus omega n. So, what happens when d is less or greater than 1? When d is larger than 1, what we have is a series of two first-order systems. And that's not very interesting. With d larger than 1, the poles are on the real axis and the response is somehow similar with the one we saw in the first order. Note that the limit case when d equal to 1, the double pole case, it's the fastest response in this situation. The system becomes more interesting when d is less than 1, and now the poles become complex. This is with the imaginary part. When d is between 0 and 1, the poles are complex conjugate at the distance omega n from the origin and with an angle that only depends on the damping factor d. Note that for the limit case, when d is equal to zero, the system will be no longer stable. This plot, using several colors, depicts the several types of response we can get by changing the damping factor between one and zero. On one extreme, with d equal to one, we have the double pole, a smooth curve without any overshoot. On the other end, we have d equal to zero, and the response is a sinusoidal oscillation. In between, we have different values of overshoot. The value of the frequency omega n only affects the time scale. This represented time scale is for a natural frequency of one radian per second. Let us now add the zero to the second order system and see what happens. 
The presence of a zero near the complex poles usually increases the overshoot effect. But if the zero is on the right semi-alpha of the complex plane, instead of an overshoot, we will have an undershoot. And I can tell you that this can be quite problematic in the development of the controller. So what is the utility of this knowledge? A first use of this is to experimentally model the plant. So imagine that you want to get a model of plan the plant F. You have the actuators and the sensors. So you get a step generator and apply a signal to the actuator. And you get the response at the sensors and you register both. So from the input and the output, you can analyze the data and take the plant model using the second order knowledge that you have now. Okay, finally it's time to talk about control. So, take this example of a robot arm and this robot arm will be the plant. And the objective is to control the robot arm position. For that you need some type of reference position that you desire the robot arm to follow. You get the position sensor to measure the position of the arm and you will compare the position that comes from the sensor with the reference position you get from the joystick. And by observing the deviation, you can get an actuation. So, how can we do it more automatically? You get this device, the controller, that is supposed to de be developed by you. You get the reference signal, electrically, of course, you get the sensor position electrically, of course. You compute the error, you compute the control action, and using the actuator from the system, from the plant, you actuate with the control action. And by doing that, you are closing the loop. This is the control system. So we, we will be referring many times to the control system, and the control system is exactly this. The control system is represented by the block diagram with the plant F and the controller C. The output of the plant Y to be controlled is compared with the reference R to compute an error that fits the controller. The controller observes this deviation between the desired and actual values of the output and perform a corrective action U on the plant. And this happens continuously. In order to start the development of the controller, we need to discuss with our client what is the expected performance for the control system. We need to specify the control system. One aspect is, of course, the accuracy on the tracking reference, and the type of reference signal. Usually it goes by steps. Another important aspect is the resulting time constants of the control system, how fast it converges to the reference. We have seen this slide on the course introduction, where we have several motives for disliking this response. Namely, the permanent error, or oscillations, or large overshoot, or even divergence. So these are the things we don't want. We want, as in a control objective, that the output Y follows R. So the objective is to track the reference signal as close as possible. And of course, stability is a basic requirement.
There are several parameters we can use to characterize the expected time response. The first is overshoot. This is the percentual excess at the peak over the final value. The static gain, which is the amplitude of the variation divided by the amplitude of the step at the input. The rise time, or the time needed to reach 90% of the final value. And finally, the settling time, which is the time needed to get to the plus minus band around the final value. A common approach is to use a second order transfer function to specify the desired behavior of the control system. Because we know the relationship between the damping factor and the overshoot, or the relation between the rise time and the parameters d and omega n, or the relation between the settling time and d and omega n. There is this special case when d is equal to square root of 2 divided by 2, this is 0707, where the poles at are at 45 degrees. At 45 degrees, we only have an overshoot of 5%. This is 30% faster than d equal to 1. So we can make use of this to increase the speed of our response. So when we are talking requirements with our client, we start by a specification model. And from this specification model, we try to translate this in an H star, so a desired function, that is represented by a second order system. Then, the next step is to meet the specs. Meeting the specs is then to design a control system that matches as close as possible this H star, so this desired model, this specification model. So we know that the control system H is given by the feedback of the controller and the plant, and the controller is to be designed by us. So, what is coming next? Our objective as the control problem is to find the controller CS such that when we close the loop with the controller and the plant, we get the control system H, this control system is as close as possible on the specification model, so this H star. And this is all for today. Thank you very much. Send me your feedback on this video, press like if you did, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel to get the rest of the story. Thank you. Bye-bye.